Francisco here, BRX Performance. We're going to discuss today a hot topic among all sports, but especially in baseball. We're going to talk about conditioning. Uh, so conditioning, in a nutshell, it will be a form of training to prepare the body for the metabolic and cardiovascular demands of an activity. The main purpose for most of conditioning is going to be to enhance work capacity, so you can do more of your specific uh, sport work, improve recovery between bouts using an, an active method. So as you guys are familiar, there's a lot of passive methods such as like cold top, hot tops, um, steam machines. Uh, this will be a different method to allow for more recovery from an active standpoint and maximize physiological response to stress and raise the threshold. As you see on the left, uh, there's a graph about where our heart rate is as a pitcher during the game. So it's around 130 to 140. Um, there's always a margin of error going up or down, but for the most part, uh, we're gonna be between the zone three and zone two of our heart rate. Uh, we're gonna discuss that further, what's that gonna look like. Uh, when we're resting between innings, you, you're gonna see there our heart rate stay between 105 and 95, so still kind of in the zone one, zone two. So we wanna make sure that we can train our body in a way that's gonna allow us to uh, recover between innings, but also be able to maintain our performance through the course of an outing. In order to understand conditioning, we need to understand the energy system. So in a nutshell, we have three systems that are always working. So don't think about like when you sprint, you're only gonna use the ATP, or when you go for a jog, you're only gonna use the aerobic system. They're all turning, they're all on, but they're turn, um, their focus change depending on what the demands of the activity is. So the aerobic system is gonna, always gonna be active. So think about like, is the, this is the main system that we use to breathe. So when we're walking, when we're running, we need some type of oxygen running through our body. So it's always gonna be on. Um, it's essential for recovery and the foundation for other systems. So if we have a really poor aerobic system, we're gonna have a hard time trying to maximize our ATP system or our glycolytic system. Our glycolytic system acts as a support for the ATP. So let's say if we were to do a sprint that lasts more than 10 seconds, then our glycolytic system kind of kicks in to continue to allow us to maintain our high intensity output. It uses glucose for energy, that's what the name is coming from. The ATP is the energy system that's available at the right time when we're trying to sprint or swing or throw a baseball and only lasts about 10 seconds. So all this um, storage is actually in your muscles uh, for quick access. This is why it's important creating supplementations because we want to create a bank to support our activities if they're highly explosive. So as you notice here, when we're doing aerobic system, our RPE is going to be slightly below 70%. When we're trying to access the glycolytic system, it's going to be around 70 to 90% of RPE. And when we're using ATP, we're looking at a max intensity effort. So in the previous slide, we discussed about the, the different energy systems. And here's a little bit graphic of what kind of uh, conditioning you can use to address those systems, but also how can we you map out your conditioning in a way that's gonna maximize your development without affecting recovery. Um, so if you look at the green will be things that will address the aerobic system in a way without overtaxing the joints, um, where like the yellow and Orange will be more towards the glycolytic system, and the ATP will be more towards the sprint. Remember, all these systems are working together, but the, some of them take over in certain parts of your conditioning aspect. Um, so we want to make sure that we have a, a good aerobic system because um, if our heart rate, if we have a hard time recovering, we're never going to access the ATP system if our heart rate is always fighting to get over that hump. Uh, so for an aerobic standpoint, we can do exercises such as 100 yard striders, and our work rest ratio is important. As you notice here, as as become more explosive, we're gonna need more rest time in order to perform the same amount of work. And so we can train the specific system that we're trying to develop. For baseball, we're looking more at the ATP to the glycolytic system, but we can neglect the aerobic system because it's part of the foundation. So we're probably looking at hitting the aerobic system maybe once a week, where this system are gonna be more touch points, like two to three times, or sometime in a daily basis, depending on what we're trying to achieve from an adaptation standpoint. So from a long interval, we can do 100 yard striders. This will be like a 20 to 30 seconds work, but then we're gonna allow the athlete to rest about 30 to one minute. We can do a sprint jog walk, which is sprinting for 50 yards, jogging for 50 yards, and walking for 50 yards. So technically the work will be about 10 to 15 seconds, but then we're gonna walk, which is gonna last about 30 seconds. Three to quarter poles, Although poles get a, a bad uh, reputation, it's because it's a nonstop activity, but you can actually create poles in a way that allows for proper rest, so we can maximize the recovery of an athlete, but also look for the adaptation that we're looking for to help uh, the athletes along the way. So a three-quarter pole will be like a 15 to 20 seconds, and then they're gonna walk for like a quarter of a pole, which will be equal to like about a minute rest. 
as we go down the line, you're going to see that the work um, is less and the rest increases. So if we're looking at like a short interval, 70 to 80 percent RPE, a cut 30 will last about 15 seconds with a 30 second rest. A half gasser, which is a football drill, will last about 30 seconds. So you have to make sure that you have to give the athletes a one minute rest between bouts. Um, a quarter pull should last 10 seconds, and if you walk back, it should be equal to like 30 to 40 seconds. When we get into the agility points, this will about five to 10 second bursts, and the rest time increases by 10. So we're looking like 30 seconds for a pro agility, 30 seconds for a box drill, and then 30 seconds for like a bond defense. That's what it will take most of the time, unless it's a big line. So don't think about um, creating specific drills to address certain system. Practice sometimes can take care of this. Like if you're doing bond defense with your pitchers, you can do them uh, two or three times a week. If you maximize the output that they're putting on their bond defense, that you're getting some agility work on that regard. Lastly, our spring work, um, we're trying to go at 90 to 100%. So if you run for 10 yards, that's about one to two seconds. This is when you can actually get a little bit closer to what a pitch clock will look like at the collegiate or professional baseball. Um, but just to help athletes to be able to recover from like a high intensity drill. Um, so they will sprint for one to two seconds, rest 15 seconds, and then spring agility, three to six seconds. So this, uh, this drill is putting a cone at five yards, and they will run to the count, run back, and then run 20 or 30, whatever the distance you prescribe. Uh, it's a combination between agility and, um, and sprint work, and the rest time will be 20 seconds for that. And for 30 yards, should last about four to five seconds, and the rest time should be 20. So here we're gonna go over some layouts, especially this will be an example for a high school, middle school pitcher, starting pitcher with relievers. We wanna um, not do as many long intervals. We wanna probably focus on the short interval agility because for the most part, they're getting um, some of their work if they're a two-way guy, um, like a position player and slash reliever. They're getting most of their aerobic work through practice, through just being on the field on a daily basis uh, where your starting pitchers might be missing some of this because they don't spend too much time in the game or shagging or things like that. But you can also consider shagging as a long interval kind of uh, modality for that stand. Um, so for the most part, they have a seven day to recover between outings for a starter if you use it properly, right? Some, sometimes the rest is gonna be a little shorter, so you have to adjust on that. But on day one will be your pitch day, and the holy focus of the day will be to win the day, compete. You shouldn't have to worry about doing conditioning after. Um, maybe your anchor doesn't need to be a, a priority at that day, because most, for the most part, you should empty all the tank that you have. Um, if you empty your, the, the tank that you have, you want to maximize the recovery window, and sometimes adding extra stuff like arm care or running after can be detrimental to recovery. doesn't mean that it's impossible, but you got to watch out how often do you do it because it kind of sets you back through the period of a year. Uh, on day two, we definitely want to get some type of long interval, and not for the flush uh, kind of term. It's more for like the muscle acidosis. We need to get rid of waste byproduct caused by damage to cells, and the best way to do that is to get your heart rate going. Um, and that can be from an active standpoint, which would be like long interval kind of drills, or you can get in a hot tub, um, you can go for a walk, you can meditate. There's a lot of things that can, can help your heart rate to that point that will work as an active recovery and just get some blood flow, um, mobility, um, yoga, things like that can get the heart rate at the same level. But for the most part, if you have to go to practice, you most likely will have to do some, some kind of pull variation, but it cannot be a nonstop modality. You have to make sure that you can rest so your heart can recover from that, get blow to the right tissue, and then we move again. Um, so for this sample, we're gonna use a three quarter pole times six, and he's gonna walk a quarter pole. Day three, since we have more time to recover, it will be a good day to kind of just take a day to just go to practice, enjoy your day. You don't have to do any conditioning. On day four, most likely will be your bullpen day. These days might change the panel of your school, so you can move these things around as you see fit. But a short interval will be a one word ratio to a one or two wet, uh, rest ratio, and we're gonna perform a cut 30. For agility, this will be, a pro agility will be an example. We're trying to do a one word rest five to 10 times that. Day six before you're outing, you can take it as a rest. We're gonna sprint the day before you're outing to prime you. So for priming can be a medicine ball work or it can be spring work and this will take us to our day one on pitch day. So here we're gonna look at what a collegiate baseball conditioning should look like. You go from being a high school where you have seven days to recover between an outing if you're a starter to have six days to recover if you're um, a collegiate starter. Same thing, on pitch day we wanna make sure that we're winning the day, we're competing. Um, on day two, we want to select some type of long interval just to get some blood flow going, not from the, from the um, lactic acid kind of thing, but it's more from like 
getting some of the byproduct that's created through outings. We're gonna use our 100 yard striders for that. We have a day that we can spare to kind of take a day just to recover, just to go to practice, just treat it as a regular day, not, nothing as extra work. Um, for your bullpen, so you can pick some type of short interval, like we mentioned, 60 yard shuttle. For agility, we can use bunt defense if the coach has it as a schedule for, for some of the pitchers. Um, for day six, as we talk about the primer, the primer can be either spring work or medicine ball work. It can be um, water equipment work. So there's a lot of things that you can get um, changed to make sure that we're addressing the right type of adaptations that we want for the day of the game. Um, this is where we kind of discuss if you have access to technologies as a heart rate, uh, we can make sure that we stay in certain zones while we're trying to get through this day. So for example, on a long interval, we want to be on between a zone one and a zone two. On the short interval, we, we want to get into a zone two, closer to a zone three, and around day five, day six, we want to make sure we get into that zone three slash zone four. Zone four will be really hard to get, and some athletes get there um, just because of certain limitations, but for the most part, they're going to stay between zone three and zone two. So this is an example of, the, of what we use in the past for professional baseball players, um, me being as an organization with the Detroit Tigers as a minor league strength conditioning coordinator. This is a model that was uh, really useful to develop guys through the minor leagues. Um, even prior coordinators use a similar model. Some organizations still use this kind of model. Some organizations are going in a different direction. For, for the most part, um, on day one, they want to make sure that they're winning the day, they're competing. Some of the pitchers will do some arm care after or some kind of recovery uh, modality. But the main focus will be like, make sure you can develop as a starter, get as many innings as you can, perform as the best you can, really focus on like being a ball player. On day two, uh, this is when we changed a little bit. We decided to go away from a weight varying kind of interval, long interval training, uh, just because the day before, most of the athletes produce a lot of output, all right? They throw about 90 to 100 miles per hour, or even above that. And we want to make sure that they're not destroying more of their joints because they, they put a lot of force into the ground. So they're jamming their hips, they're jamming their knee, and a lot of things are getting overused. So the next day, we're trying to make sure they're not doing a lot of weight varying. So we pick um, modalities such as bike, bike interval or sled work just to restore some range of motion, um, but just to avoid a lot of the ground contact kind of modalities that tend to cause a lot of damage over time. On day three and day four, those days are most of the time on interchange depending on how the athlete feels. But for the most part, it will be a bullpen day. And we're trying to use either a short interval to kind of develop some work capacity because some of these guys start with like three to four innings and eventually they need to catch up to throwing seven to eight innings as a starter. So we use drills like cut 30s, gassers, nothing, nothing out of ordinary. Um, on bullpen, day four, day four is a bullpen. We use an agility. They can use PFP for that, just kind of like we talk about like bunt defense. Um, we can use those modalities or we can use pro agility too. The day before the game, they will use a sprint or primers. Uh, this is an area that we started using a lot of the water field training to kind of get used to the pattern that they're going to use the next day while trying to get some kind of heart rate closer to uh, what they're going to perform so they can be ready to get their CNS going in the right direction. Here we're going to look at some things that we need to consider when we're prescribing conditioning for most of our athletes regarding all the sport. Um, first of all, you, do you know the forces are up to two to three times your body weight during running, right? That's actually more than you can probably perform in a weight room no matter how heavy you are, this, when you run, you're producing the most force, dam the more force damage to your joints. So we wanna make sure that as the overall mass of an athlete increases, we have to make sure that we're controlling the weight varying volume. How often do they get ground contact reaction? Um, how much yardage are we trying to prescribe for this athlete? But for the most part, this can be um, managed However, this is a, a big cause for a lot of issues on the lower half for a lot of pitchers or a lot of position players because they're, it's their foot functional for weight bearing con conditioning. And by that means, like if you notice here on this image, we have a collapsed arch and a collapsed arch is gonna lead a lot of energy, a lot of um, stress towards the knee joint, towards the hip because the energy is not really transferring efficiently. So for this athlete, we wanna make sure that the weight bearing volume is stay fairly low because if you don't, you're gonna run into risk of having like shin splints, uh, knee issues, hip issues that along the way is gonna cause into a surgery kind of thing. Position players, it's gonna be a little, little different approach. So position players, two to three times per week, the focus should be on sprint agility modalities to make sure if they didn't get enough touch points in the games. Like if, if they're sprinting all the time in the game, you don't need to prescribe conditioning for those guys. Um, but if you have a guy that hasn't touched the bag in a long time or hasn't performed a high intensity sprint, we really wanna make sure we address that because that's the only way to prepare the hamstring while they're gonna happen in the game. If you're on sprint, you're not gonna be prepared for what 
the demands of the games are from a tissue standpoint. Other consideration for conditioning, we want to make sure we're not using conditioning as a punishment. Um, that carries a relationship that exercise is a bad thing and kind of the, defeat the purpose of long-term development for a lot of athletes. They're going to spend more time doing things that they enjoy, and if they see exercise as a punishment, it's going to affect that relationship that they see between like running, working out, um, being with their teammates as a part of a punishment. We want to avoid long and short interval closer to competition day because the, the brain made the connection that he needs to perform at a slower pace for the outing. So we want to make sure that we use similarities such agility or sprints um, days prior to the outing so the brain starting to understand like, okay, in the next few days, you got to perform at a high level intensity and the long and short interval kind of defeats that purpose. It kind of create more stress to the CNS than it needed to be. Uh, from a lactic, a lactic acid is a med. Most of acidosis is actually what's happening on the muscle, and it happens because of a lack of oxygen. So if you think about if you do an exercise for a long period of time, you feel the burn. Uh, that burn is just a lack of oxygen to the tissue. And how do we fix that? Yes, we need to get the, the heart to pump and the lungs to provide enough oxygen. There are so many ways you can do that. You can do that with your own breath. <sighs> how to kind of oxygenate your tissue. You can go for a walk, you can meditate, you can get in a hot tub. As long as there's some kind of flow circulating, um, the muscle acidosis will go away and the lactic acid cannot be possible in your blood because it will actually um, fail to do its purpose. So it's actually called lactate and it's what allows to continue running, pushing through the ATP, pushing through the glycolytic system and eventually you have to slow down for oxygen to get to your tissue to get rid of what we call a muscle acidosis. We need to understand really, really well local versus general conditioning. A lot of the things that we mentioned today were uh, from a general conditioning standpoint, right? Like we all have a heart, we all have a lung, so we have to make sure that the heart doesn't understand if you're running or you're throwing. Uh, it's just adapt to what the stress is happening. So we want to make sure that local conditioning is also happening in baseball, right? We have to make sure that our athletes are throwing the necessary amount of throws to withstand what they're going to happen in the game, the kind of intensity they're going to throw in the game. They have to make sure that we, the bullpens are a higher intensity in certain part of the year to make sure that we can develop a specific adaptation to the tissue that are gonna be used for the specific sport. If this content interests you, if you wanna know more about BRX, please subscribe, we have our channel on YouTube and you can follow us on all of our social media. Thank you for watching.